Chapter 15 focuses on community and ecosystem ecology. Up to this point in previous chapters, we've looked at ecology in the context of examining how organisms interact with one another. And in this particular chapter, we're going to focus more on the, the big picture, on the entire ecosystem and how organisms fit into that ecosystem. One of the focuses, really the primary focuses of this chapter, is going to be on preserving biodiversity. And so it'll look at the impacts that humans have had on biodiversity. And so we want to begin this discussion, as would be logical, by uh, defining and, and explaining briefly the Endangered Species Act. This is a law that was passed in 1973 um, that was the first law, this was the first law that actually had teeth that protected organisms in the environment. Um, and so in other words, if a, an organism is placed on the endangered species list, and it's very difficult to get an organism placed there, but once it's there, then any uh, killing of that organism or destruction of the habitat that that organism relies on uh, is accompanied by a very large fine uh, if the, the perpetrators are caught. And so interestingly, this was the first law that, that really had teeth behind it that protected organisms. Um, and, and it had some interesting consequences, as we'll talk about during the course of our chapter here. Um, the purpose of this law was to preserve biodiversity. And we talk about <clears throat> biodiversity as the entire collection of living things uh, that are found in a certain area. The purpose of the law is to avoid extinction. Extinction, of course, is the complete loss of a species. As we'll mention in this chapter, there are a handful of organisms that humans have hunted or, I guess, always hunted. Sometimes we destroy habitat and sometimes we introduce toxins that hurt organisms, but typically hunted to the point in which there are no organisms uh, left at all. We probably shouldn't draw a distinction here, too, between the word hunting and simply exploitation. Um, so we use the word hunting there fairly loosely. Um, hunting in and of itself today is, is a, a tightly regulated um, aspect of wildlife management that's generally accepted, perhaps I should say universally accepted, as beneficial for the populations of organisms themselves. Occasionally extinction has occurred because in the past we didn't have any sort of management or rules or, or, or anything of that nature. We simply went out and killed all the organisms we could take and that was it for that particular species. All right, so let's talk about an example as we begin this chapter. The California condor is perhaps the most famous example of a species placed on this endangered species list. The California condor is a huge bird with a 10-foot wingspan, and it's basically a gigantic vulture or buzzard. Um, California condors uh, eat dead organisms, and their populations decline dramatically in the 60s and 70s uh, as a result of uh, lead poisoning. Um, <clears throat> so people would shoot um, animals, uh, say if they were hunting, shot an animal and then they couldn't find it. Well, the shot at the time was, was uh, composed of lead and so these organisms, the California condors, would come along and eat the dead animals and uh, ingest that lead and die as a result of that. Um, poison carcasses were placed out. In other words, people would take a dead animal and, and put something like uh, strychnine or uh, cyanide in it. And the purpose of that was to kill, this is probably also not a good idea in most cases as we've since learned, but to kill animals like coyotes or and perhaps wolves, cougars. All these things were, um, at least the latter two, not coyotes, populations of those animals were decimated as a result of this practice. Um, poaching, which is illegal hunting, and DDT, which is an insecticide, all of these things uh, led to a decimation of the population of California condors. So fascinatingly, in, in 1987, there were only 22 condors that remained. And we made a decision that's never been made before or since in the history of the world. So we went and caught all 22 California condors and brought them into captivity and so we did this captive breeding program uh, to preserve the condors. Uh, you may have heard of this program so the picture that you see on the right of the screen shows a puppet that, that uh, is just a, a puppet that's supposed to look like a condor head that's feeding that little chick and of course the purpose of that is so that the condor grows up thinking it's a condor and not a person so it can eventually be released into the wild and, and raise offspring on its own. They had some trouble 
with condors raised in captivity, as you might imagine, um, these condors didn't know what power lines were. Um, they had some, some other issues, and so some of these didn't do so well anyway, but at least they made an attempt to make sure that the condors thought they were condors when they were put back into the wild. And it was successful by most estimations. And so in April 2008, there was 300 con there are or were 300 condors present on the face of the earth. 147 of these were in the wild. That's versus 22 uh, back in the, the mid 80s there. And so the uh, first wild reproduction was uh, reported in 2003. Um, but this, of course, comes at a fairly steep cost. And so the total cost to date has been 35 million. Um, per year and this program continues today and so it's fairly controversial uh, you realize that some people would argue well I don't care that much about these big buzzard like animals we see a collection of four of them on top of a mountain here eating a dead goat uh, it appears to be um, all of them are, are tagged as you can see and people would say well that money could have been put to better use helping humans for instance or, or some other um, some other use uh, so it's an interesting question, but this has been one of the most dramatic examples of preserving biodiversity um, that ties directly into the Endangered Species Act that we have um, participated in as a country. All right, so let's talk about biodiversity <clears throat> as we continue our discussion here. When we talk about uh, biodiversity, we typically talk about different uh, types of biodiversity. We can, we can talk about ecological diversity, and when we do this, we're talking about the diversity of adaptations that we observe in organisms. And so, for instance, how do organisms obtain their food? When you think about birds, this is a great example of uh, ecological diversity. So I saw a hummingbird just uh, yesterday or day before yesterday. So that's a fascinating um, method that uh, they employ a fascinating method to obtain food, buzzing around and drinking nectar. Um, and you can think about birds that you would see just on a daily basis if you drive around. So they're vulture, they're buzzards, not vultures here in Central Kentucky, but everywhere. And so that's also an interesting uh, lifestyle. They fly around <coughs> looking down for dead animals, and, and if they find something dead, they land and, and eat it. Um, you can think about your songbirds uh, that consume little seeds or possibly insects. Um, and so that, that's an example of ecological diversity. Um, all of those adaptations that we see for obtaining food are different, and, and so we would say that, that birds have a very high, e fairly high ecological diversity. Genetic diversity um, deals with the differences in genes within a particular species. So, um, for example, we have a particular species of trout found here in North America, referred to as a brook trout. Uh, brook trout are found as far south as um, Tennessee and northern Georgia. Northern Georgia is as far south as they go. They stretch down along the Appalachian Mountains. And then they're found north all the way up into Canada. And so that's one species, but if we look at the genes found in that species, we see that the individuals found in Canada are much different genetically than the ones found in uh, Georgia. The ones found in Georgia are found in little tiny streams. And so even if you take those little tiny brook trout and place them in an environment where they have all the food that they want, they won't get much bigger than eight or 10 inches. But the ones up in Canada, if you do the same thing, will get to be 30 inches in length. And so obviously there's a difference in the genetic makeup of these organisms. Even though they're the same species, there's genetic diversity in that species. Phylogenetic diversity considers the degree to which <clears throat> different organisms are related. And so the more distantly related uh, the organisms are within a collection of animals, the higher phylogenetic diversity you have. You remember those phylogenetic trees that we looked at that show how organisms are related. So. What we're saying here then is that if the organisms in a population uh, come from very distant branches on that tree, then that means that they're not very closely related, and so the phylogenetic diversity is very high. We also want to mention the term endemic at this particular point. And so an endemic organism is an organism whose distribution is limited to a very small area. We have examples of endemic organisms found on the screen. I'll mention the one, uh, just the one to the far right there, the crayfish that's labeled Barbicambaris cornutus. This is an interesting endemic species found here in Kentucky. This species is endemic to the Barren River system, which is just southwest, I believe, of Bowling Green. So if you go to Bowling Green, go south and, and down towards uh, Tennessee there, then you'll find this particular crayfish in that uh, stream drainage. And this is a huge crayfish. It gets to be seven inches long or so. It has little hair. <coughs> 
on its antenna, but interestingly it's found only there in the Barren River system, just a, in a couple county area, and nowhere else on the face of the earth. And so that species is endemic. Barbicambarus cornutus is endemic to that area. We can ask the question logically, why is conservation of biodiversity important? And so we want to answer that uh, attempt to, to at least put forth a couple explanations that may be potential answers to that question. One is moral responsibility, and so um, particularly as a Christian, then you can look at the, you may uh, look at, many Christians do, look at the environment as our responsibility. Um, we're placed here as something of stewards, uh, and part of our, our role is to, to be a good steward of what we've been given, and part of what we've been given is the environment. Now, everyone, of course, may not buy into that particular argument, and so we also want to talk about economic benefits um, to preserving biodiversity. And one of these very powerful economic uh, benefits is drug development. And so over 100 important medicinal drugs have been extracted from flowers. The very most, uh, the most famous one is the rosy periwinkle from the island of Madagascar that's used in the treatment of childhood leukemia and has had a dramatic influence on the survival rate of childhood leukemia. Antibiotics also come from various sources. The very uh, first penicillin, as you may remember, came from a moldy cantaloupe, uh, shown here, not the original cantaloupe, but there's a moldy cantaloupe for you, found in Peoria, Illinois, at a fruit market. Um, and uh, toxic organisms also sometimes contain compounds that are useful to human health. Here we have some so-called poison arrow frogs and, and uh, extract from their skin um, that makes up the toxin has been useful in different uh, development of different drugs. And so this is uh, extremely valuable when a drug is found. It's extremely valuable in terms of, of uh, economic benefit for the discoverer and benefit for everyone in terms of the, the actual use of that drug. And so if organisms go extinct, of course, we lose those products associated with those particular organisms and we never have a chance to see if they might have some useful um, say pharmaceutical pro pro uh, products that are associated with them. Now if you don't like that argument then we can also mention that uh, biodiversity is often associated with recreation. Some of us like to fish, some of us like to hunt which is what that gigantic moose is there up in Alaska. Some of us like to go look at grizzly bears um, as we see in the lower left hand picture as they eat salmon that are swimming upstream in Alaska and some people like to uh, go on African safaris. And so um, all of these are recreational activities that bring money uh, to areas, bring money to people that live in the areas uh, that have the, the biodiversity nearby. Um, and, and so you've got to have the biodiversity for these uh, activities to occur. Um, ecotourism is becoming more and more common in today's world. There's a recent story, maybe not so recent now, year, year and a half ago, where at a village in the Philippines, there was a huge crocodile, like a 21-foot crocodile, a massive animal. And instead of killing it, they, they caught it. And instead of killing it, as they would have in the past, um, they kept it and put it in this little park um, that is fenced in that they're going to pay people to, to come and charge people uh, and allow them to look at the animals in that park. And so that crocodile will be a huge attraction to that part. So biodiversity also has an economic benefit in terms of recreation. Biodiversity is also a good indicator of environmental quality. Um, a great example of this is the DDT that we mentioned earlier in the context of the condors. And so DDT is a pesticide structure of which is shown here. It's very very good at, at uh, killing insects. Um, ironically we now uh, think now Paul Mueller received the Nobel Prize uh, for inventing DDT in 1948. Now DDT turned out, as you're going to hear in just a moment, to be kind of a bad idea, but we didn't realize that in 1948 when he received that Nobel Prize. It became available in 1945 as an agricultural insecticide. It did a great job, as I pointed out before, at getting rid of insect pests on crops. As it turns out, DDT also has an impact on animals in the environment including but not limited to birds, like the um, osprey that we see here, a fish-eating bird. A uh, hawk, big eagle-like bird, actually, very, very large uh, raptor. And the effect that it has is this. It makes the eggshells of these birds very thin. 
and so the eggs are laid and the eggs break in the nest and the birds never raise any offspring and so bald eagles and other birds went right to the brink of extinction as a result of the bioaccumulation in other words the transfer of DDT from through through the food chain um, but uh, DDT was banned by the EPA in 1972 and those birds have made a, a fairly strong comeback and so the point here is that the eagles and raptors of different types were disappearing and the, that reduction in biodiversity was an indication that something was wrong in the environment, that DDT was present in the environment and causing uh, issues there. DDT is actually fairly harmful for humans as well, as we've since discovered, and so it's not such a good idea. We also want to mention that uh, maintenance of ecosystem function is an important aspect of biodiversity, and so more diverse ecosystems are better able to withstand adverse conditions. So. Here's an example from our text. Actually, this is from the ecology text, but here's a, a perfect example. So here we have a population of plants that went through a drought, and we have biomass that remained after the drought. In other words, how many plants were present there after the drought on the y-axis. The higher we go, the more plants remain. And here we have species richness on the x-axis. And so species richness reflects the number of species present. And so we see that if we have few species, we end up with few plants after the drought. And the more species we have, the more uh, plants are left after that drought. Um, and so the, the species richness has a positive influence. Increasing biodiversity has a positive influence on the survival of these plants through a drought. We also see that key, there's something called keystone species that are very important in maintaining uh, maintaining populations and organisms and keeping ecosystems intact. And so a keystone species is a species that impacts all other species in the ecosystem. Wolves being an example. And so when wolves were brought back to Yellowstone National Park, interestingly, areas that had previously been open fields uh, grew up with aspen trees and became forest. And so wolves, of course, have no direct influence on those aspen trees. They're not planting aspen trees or something of that nature, but what wolves are doing is they're eating the elk and they're eating the mule deer that graze those clear areas. Not only that, but they are causing the elk and mule deer to graze in different areas. Um, and so they're avoiding certain areas and those areas are not ever, the little trees are never eaten and so they grow up into forest. And so wolves are a keystone uh, species for that reason. They have an impact on all these different organisms in the environment because the, without wolves you have a field, with wolves you have a forest and so of course that impacts many different organisms although indirectly and so keystone species are important in maintaining the integrity of a particular ecosystem. We now want to turn our, our focus to extinctions and uh, why animals go extinct. Now if we look at the history of the world, this is from our text, we see that we have had uh, several different extinctions during the course of the world, and so uh, as best we can tell. And so here's present, here's 600 million years ago, and so these circles represent these mass extinctions when a number of organisms went extinct uh, at once. And so the question is, are we now headed towards a, a sixth extinction? And then the bigger question is, are humans responsible for that? Of course we weren't present for these other extinctions and so we're not responsible for that but the question becomes what about this what about today are, are we driving organisms to the point of extinction we'll take a look at the primary reasons that organisms become extinct as a result of human activity in our next lecture